Seattle job uh, markets, the low wage worker in the new minimum wage study. I have to say that I like the fact that the folks at the University of Washington put all of this context of this study in perspective of this is a red hot market. Seattle is on fire when it comes to job creation. Thanks, Donald Trump. And because of that, it's not a normal situation. Let's find another city and compare it to Seattle just as far as minimum wage. Right now, Seattle first in with 15 now, whole idea of having not a minimum wage but a livable wage. That was the thing that they came up with. Of course, the unions want to push it to make it more expensive to hire somebody who's not in the union to give them the advantage. But the study came out. Remember, this was like about a year ago. And then, of course, the city of uh, Seattle got wind that it was not going to be the most um, uh, positive news. So they found a counter study in Berkeley in order to counter the one that was coming out from the University of Washington. Uh, this new one comes out, and we learn a couple of things. Have you gotten a chance to read it? I have. Okay, so let's play the cuts. University of Washington researcher Jacob, um, I'm going to even try to dig door, explains what they found in their latest minimum wage study. By the way, minimum wage study. Minimum wage! Yeah! Yeah! Is that, is that Gandalf? <laughs> no, that's not Gandalf. It could be. I don't know. We start out with about 14,000 people who we observe in our data working the lowest paid jobs in Seattle at the beginning of 2015 before the minimum wage started going up. There's a big distinction between those who, are, who had put in more hours on the job and those who had put in less hours on the job. The workers who had put in more hours on the job actually came out ahead and they saw about $20 a week increase in their pay. Um, they did see their hours go down a little bit, but not enough to, to sort of circumvent the, the wage increases. The less experienced workers, they more or less broke even. They did see their hourly wages go up, but their hours were cut back enough that basically they're ending up making about the same amount of money. They're, they're, wor- they're working fewer hours to, to make that money. Oh, oh my okay. God, that was so boring. Can I, you want me to translate it for it? Like, that made no sense. It did. It made perfect sense. No, it didn't. Here, here's here's the, the point is... There are two different tiers of the low wage workers. One is getting a higher; they have more experience. They're working more hours, mm-hmm. so they're more full, more fully employed low wage workers. And those people have actually seen a benefit and increase. They're making more money now, like uh, ten dollars a week. Yeah, the the guys, the the people that were working less hours, so they were less employed low wage workers. Mm-hmm. They haven't seen any increase in total earnings. The hours have been cut back. Correct. Yes. Because this is the big argument that people would have. There's a finite amount of money to pay to these workers. And if you say that, hey, they're going to have to make this much money an hour, they're still going to make the same amount of money. They're just going to work fewer hours to get that money because companies aren't going to increase the amount of money they're going to spend on wages. And what it turns out is that's true if you're talking about people who don't work as many hours. But if there's someone who is working more hours who would presumably be more qualified, they are actually experiencing a boost in take-home pay. It's all about productivity. If somebody can let you – I hate the flipping hamburger thing. But if somebody can flip 100 hamburgers in an hour and each hamburger nets X amount of dollars in profit because the person's producing 100 of them to meet demand, then you get part of that production in. But if you can only flip 10 in an hour, you're not producing enough in order to justify your salary. So therefore, you are a cost burden to the company. You have to produce enough in order to justify the amount of money you're making. If somebody doesn't have the skills, you're not going to pay the person to sit there and scratch their ass for eight hours while they're not producing enough. It's all about production. And that's the problem when you all of a sudden increase. You don't increase the production, but you increase the cost of the person at the job, but they don't increase the production element. There's a cost to the business when it comes to profit. There was a flaw in this study. Which one? This one. The one we heard the most boring man alive just talk about. I have three more cuts of it. You keep calling him boring. People are not going to want to listen. Okay, play it. See if he's more exciting this time. Wow. So the the third group that we're trying to keep track of is people who weren't yet employed by the time the minimum wage goes up. And so what we see in Seattle is that the number of people newly entering the workforce sort of peaked right around the time the minimum wage started increasing, and it's actually declined since then. Oh, shocking. So let me get this straight. So if you increase the cost of something, people buy less of it. And whether that is a cheeseburger or whether that is a human being that makes a cheeseburger, again, it's the rules of economics. 
Cost more, people buy less of it, correct? Yes. Okay, good. With supply-demand curve, we got textbooks written on it, right? Right. And that's th- So you've increased the cost of hiring that person, so then less people get hired. So the less people get an opportunity to get that first step up onto the ladder, to get that first job, what leads to the next job, what leads to the next job. It's like if you said to Shama Sawant, we got 10 people in a boat. Here's what's going to happen. Um, no one else can get in the boat. So we won't be able to increase the size of the number of people in the boat. But let's say the boat could hold 20 or 30 people. So more people won't come in. And of the 10, uh, two of them will make actually less money. Are you okay with benefiting the eight at the expense of the two? We're going to throw the two overboard. They're going to make less money or maybe get laid off. But the eight will benefit from your minimum wage or your $15 livable wage. Your boat metaphor is all screwed up. No, it isn't. Can I straighten it out for you? Okay, go ahead. Here's what it is. You've got the boat with 10 people in it. And they're like, this is really uncomfortable. We're like, okay, we're going to give seat cushions to everybody. Uh We're going to give seat cushions to all 10 people that are there to make it more comfortable. Did it make it more comfortable? Yeah, but now there's only room for nine because the seat cushions got in the way. and Mm. So Mm. it it, it reduced the ability to have. But the people in the boat are more comfortable. But what about the 10th guy? Eh, Yeah, he got left behind because he doesn't fit on the boat anymore because we got these seat cushions. Okay, so can you get more people on the boat? No, No, you can't. Seat cushions. See how I straightened that out for you? Uh, go with that. Okay, is there another reason people aren't joining the Seattle workforce? There's a possibility here, which is that we're seeing fewer people come into the low wage. If he mentions seat cushions, I will be shocked. <laughs> workforce, not necessarily because there are a lot of people out there looking and not finding work. It's also possible that there are a lot fewer people looking. Because one thing that we know is that it's really expensive to live in this region. The number of people who are moving to Seattle thinking, you know, I think that I'll rent an apartment there and just try to find a minimum wage job is is probably low. Mm -hmm. So there's fewer people looking for these minimum wage jobs that are here, which would affect the number of people that are taking the minimum wage jobs? He says it's a possibility. Uh, He also says there's a takeaway for everybody in the study. Here we go. It's really a question of, of... of values as to whether they they consider this outcome to be good. Mm. For some people, uh, the folks that are taking home more money as a consequence of this, they were the people we were trying to help. They were the people who had been in the low-wage workforce for a long time. They're not necessarily upwardly mobile people. Uh, They are the people for whom these were dead-end jobs, and we've put more money in their pockets. Uh, Some people might look at the teenagers and other young people who are trying to get that first job and maybe having a little bit more difficulty, and they might say to themselves, you know, they're going to be okay in the end because they're going to stay in school, they're going to get certificates and degrees, and they're going to end up in in a labor market that's much better than the minimum wage labor market. Okay. Is this study isn't over yet. Are they still working on it? They are. And one of the other flaws in the study is I don't think it took into account chain restaurants. I think places with more than one location. It was just individual localized employers. Right. Which is interesting. At the, the, at the end, I think the thing I'm puzzled about, about minimum wage is what is, the, what is the net effect people believe is going to happen? Do they, do they think that that's going to make Seattle a more livable place for someone who's in a minimum wage, a low wage job, because the minimum wage will rise to the point where they can? Because the reality is, is that, the the demand and the the affluence of Seattle is so fast quickly outstripping any incremental gains in the low wage jobs that compared to two years ago mm-hmm. it would be much harder for a person in a low wage job to afford to live in Seattle. Mm-hmm. It, it's much harder now than it was two years ago, even though you've seen some of these gains in the actual level of of, of wage increases. Because it look how many people are making so much money and how much rents have gone up. Well, the other part of it is this. Uh, the, the business will eventually replace the human being because the human being is more expensive than the replacement. And the replacement is a machine of some sort that can do the work without calling in sick, do the work without showing up drunk or high, do the work without complaining about his girlfriend, stealing his car, or whatever else it is that goes with it when you have to hire somebody. When you hire somebody, you hire four additional problems. That's what a friend of mine has, about 100 employees. He says, for every employee I have, I've got four additional problems because that guy's got a brother or a sister or a son or a daughter or a estranged wife or something that causes some personal problem to come into the workplace. 
If it gets too expensive, you replace them. The same thing is happening at Wendy's. It's the kiosk at, Min- at McDonald's. They've got 1,000 kiosks are going in now. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not replacing people. The hell you're not replacing people. You can order from the kiosk. They find people will actually more order more goods at the kiosk, more stuff at the kiosk than they will with a human being, and you'll be able to eliminate those people. I've got a fascinating little sideline to this. Okay. Can I tell you it? Yeah, yeah. They made a Taco Bell. It's down in Los Angeles or the Southern California area mm-hmm. where it was all automated. Yes. It was entirely automated. And they monitored the sales. They're running an experiment. Say, we just get rid of the people. And you, they make the burritos, the right. double-decker tacos. I, I'm partial to the the, the chalupa. Really yes, sure. like the chalupa. Right. And they found out that the sales were, were off. So they ended up hiring people to come in who didn't do any work. They just talked to the customers. Mm. They would just talk to them. Hey, how's everything going? Can I help you input this? And that made the sales rocket. So you still needed the people there, even though the robots were doing all the work. Is that right? Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? I like the fact that um, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, uh, and Switzerland, and Iceland have no minimum wage. Minimum wage. Yeah. That's always my go-to. I threw that in Tom's face all the time. They also don't have any people. And they do. You get very low unemployment rate. Well, that's because there's five people that live in each country. And they, they, they can move around. Yeah. Uh, they all make Toblerone. Here we go. <laughs> Trump in Britain.